Um, what an amazing series it's been, um, Hope Restored. So Gary approached us, I think it was late August, early September, and asked a couple of the leaders, would you be prepared to speak? Um, I love public speaking, I never used to. So I said, I will, I will, I will. Um, and then they said, choose a topic. And I uh, thought, okay, maybe I'll chat on uh, faithfulness towards God during the COVID period. Uh, God really blessed myself, my family, and the company financially. And I thought, okay, maybe I must bring that. And Kerry said, no, 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 you must speak on physical healing. So I was like, no, 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 Kerry. For those of you who don't know, I'm a biokineticist, and I work with a traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury. So my reason for saying no, 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 is I've seen a lot of people who have prayed for healing, and it's never happened. I've seen a lot of hope, and it hasn't happened. So I was like, no, Kerry, that's wrong. That's, that's not for me, but anyway. She says, but that's what you do for a living. So I was like, okay, maybe. About five weeks ago, I went out for a jog, and Jesus, the uh, Holy Spirit approached me and said, Justin, you're speaking on physical healing. So like Leisha said, and I'm sure many of you sitting here today, sometimes physical healing has failed us. So I was like, what, what do I say? What do I say, God? And Jesus said, Holy Spirit said, Justin, tell them the stories. So I'm going to apologize up front because I can see the plumbing's already starting to break. But we have technical issues. Every now and then my uh, plumbing in my face breaks down and there's leaks through my nose and eyes. It takes about 30 minutes to restore, but don't panic. I'm fine. I've drank lots of water. I won't dehydrate. <laughs> um, yeah, so I really feel that God has brought me to this moment to speak on physical healing. But I'm going to be... Point there. Point there. Up. What? There we go. That's on. I was just pushing the wrong button. <laughs> um, God brought me to Matthew 11, verse 1 to 7. I started preparing for this preach, and I decided to go to the Bible Project. And I got to listen, I think his name's Tim Lackey. I got to listen, Mackey, Tim Mackey. I got to listen to one of his preachers. It wasn't really on healing, but it took me to this. And what I want, as we read through it, store it, we're going to come back to it later. So Matthew 11, 1 to 7, Jesus and John the baptizer. After Jesus finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he went to minister in different villages throughout the region. Now, while John the baptizer was in prison. So just imagine that. Jesus is going out to different villages, and John is in prison. He heard about what Christ was doing among the people. So he sent his disciples to ask him a question. Are you really the one prophesied would come, or should we wait for another? So Jesus answered John's disciples and said, Give John this report. The blind see again, the crippled walk, lepers are cured, deaf hear, the dead are raised back to life, and the poor are broken now, now hear the hope of salvation. And, John, and tell John, that the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me, no matter what happens. I preached about two years ago after I read this book called Why Zebras Don't Have Ulcers. And I want you to picture the scene. Serengeti, herd of zebras, and a, a pride of lions following them. The zebras are oblivious to the lions even though two days ago one of their mates got child by the lions. They continue life as normal. So they sit in there, the lions stalk them, they chase them, they kill another zebra. The zebras move off, continue grazing as if nothing happened. See, us as humans have got a cognitive ability to reason, but with that reasoning comes a change in our perception. So we fear things. We try and make sense of things. And we don't let things rest like the zebras do. So once the issue has come with the zebras, it's come done, they continue life as normal. We as humans ponder that the whole time. It goes through our thoughts the whole time, and we develop fear and worries. That's the reason why zebras don't have ulcers, because they can't worry. They don't have the cognitive ability. 
We, on the other hand, do. I read another book um, on real case studies from around the world. And uh, the story goes, it's a true story, it's not made up. A guy in America was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He um, was given around about a year to live, and he decided he's going to go, for that last year, he's going to go up, upstate to a very quiet town in America somewhere and just live out his last couple of months in peace and tranquility with his wife and family. So he went up, and when he moved into the new town, he decided to find out where the, the doctor was, and he asked that doctor, what shall I do while I'm living here? Um, you know, to maximize my health. And the doctor said everything that, that you and I know, you know, uh, eat healthy, go for lovely long walks, peaceful, just enjoy life, don't get too stressed. During that year, his health steadily improved. It steadily improved to a state where he almost was pre-cancerous. Came towards the end of the year, December, his health rapidly declined. He managed to see Christmas through, but shortly in the new year, he passed away. Doctors did an autopsy on him. He had no cancer. He believed he had the cancer. He lived a life of that cancer. It took over his life and he passed away. Which takes us to this Proverbs verse that's been repeated a lot lately. But for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. If we believe we're ill, we're going to stay ill. You see, if you take these two guys sitting in prison, you can be the guy on that side, and you can see the bars. Or you can be this guy, and you can see the view. It depends on your perception of life. It depends what you're telling yourself. And uh, I know Kerry and Louise would love this. It depends what lies you believe in. What lies the world is telling you. Because God created a perfect world. How are we seeing it? So this is a tough piece because you've got these questions to answer. Does God still ooh, water works. Does God still heal today? Is healing dependent on our faith? And did does God heal everyone? So through my stories that I'm going to go into now, real stories, I'm going to try throw them out there, and then I'm going to try come back and try and answer these questions. Before I do that, let me answer this. I don't have Alzheimer's, that's how I shake. <laughs> if we were to take the bunch of you guys, and half of you said, God does heal, he heals everyone. And the other half said, no, he doesn't heal, doesn't heal anyone. We box in God. God does not get to be boxed. We, we, we worship, believe in a God who cannot be boxed. His reasoning is way beyond our thoughts. So we cannot box God. Story time. Read my mind and then I don't have to say anything. <laughs> I'm going to start off with a couple of not so happy endings and I'm going to go to happy endings. The problem is the tears are because I know the people. I know the people that I'm talking about are listening. We've prayed for Glenn's brother. Was he healed? No. We are praying for Evan. 
We don't know what's going to happen. Closer to home, oh, tissues. You can cut that out, eh? <laughs> Closer to home, my late father in law, he wasn't a good father. I'm not going to beat about the bush. And most probably not, not many of you know of him because of that. And one day, Minnie's going to give a testimony on his life. But in his last two years, I'm not too sure if the cancer came first or if his newfound faith in God came first. But needless to say, in his last two years, things changed for him. Now, I want to paint a picture. A lot of us northern suburbs folks don't understand that, and I say this with all due respect to our nation, don't understand that there are white people who live in shacks. My father-in-law was one of those. He had a telly, and he started watching Angus Buchan on, a, on a, a Sunday morning, and he came to know God. And as I said, at the same time, I'm not too sure if the cancer came first or his, or his faith in Jesus, but steadily, his health started to, to decrease those two years. In those two years, Minnie's relationship with him was fixed. Everything was forgiven. He got to see his... I can't look there. He got to see his grandchildren, but he still died of the throat cancer. It was messy. Speaking to him was messy. Did we pray for his healing? Of course we did. Is he healed today? 100%. He's healed in more ways than one. Even closer to home. My mom-in-law. As I said to the people that are listening in Botswana and Zimbabwe, there's a lot of inaccuracies in my stories, but bear with me. About three years ago, I think it was, maybe four, Sharon, my mom-in-law, always used to come and look after our kids. It was around about December the 16th. She was in my driveway. I saw her fall. I rushed up to see her, and her femur had snapped and was sticking through her leg. I'm not good with blood. Now I'm the man in the house, and I've got to hold this stuff together. We quickly phoned the ambulance. The paramedics tell us, guys, whatever you do, don't move her, because if you move her, the femur could cut the femoral artery, and she'll bleed out. We wait. It wasn't that long for however long the ambulance gets there. The ambulance gets there. We, um, uh, my, bro my brother, who's a vet, was there as well. They put her in. And uh, while the paramedics were dealing with her, my brother calls me aside and says, Justin, there's something wrong there. The femur doesn't just snap. Um, the doctor treats her for a broken leg. He picks up something, but it's too small for the medical aid to warrant a full cancer check. I think you call it a PET scan, eh? PET scan. So she gets treated just for the broken leg. I end up treating her for a broken leg, and it doesn't heal, and I'm all the pains in the head kind of guy. I'm saying, you've got, you've, got to, you've got to use that leg. You've got to step on that leg. You've got to teach the brain how to use that leg. And she's like, still too sore. It's unstable. This is well into a year, right? Anyway, I've chosen not to work with families, so it's one of my colleagues that are working with her, and I just come through, and I check, and I can see it's not stable. So I suggest she goes back to her orthopedic surgeon. The orthopod checks, and there's a tumor the size of that on her leg, right? It's been a year. They do the scan now because now the medical aid says there's enough reason to do a scan, and uh, her body is riddled with cancer. Did Gary and Louise come to our house to pray? 100%. Did we pray against generational curses? 100%. Did many and I believe that God would heal Sharon? 100%. Did we have our reasoning for the healing? For sure. God, this is an opportunity for you to show my family. Minnie's brother's not exactly the same kind of Christian as we are. He's very doubting. We're like, 
God, this is the time. Show Barrett a miracle. Show Stacy a miracle. Show the family how you can work miracles. Show how our faith can heal Sharon. She did the whole trip, chemo, radiation. We prayed here as a church. Um, it's two years almost now. So, uh, sorry, it's got over two years. We're now in March, early March in 2018. Eh? 2018. We're uh, at church on the Friday. Sharon was going for a checkup. And uh, we were in this church Sunday morning. And we knew that the, they were going to check either Saturday or Sunday morning. Minnie gets up, rushes out of here. We came in two cars because she was always going to go to the hospital and see how mom was doing. During the service, Minnie rushes out. She leaves me a message, mom's on life support. We came forward. We prayed. This church, we prayed that day. It was probably the three most grueling months of our, relation, of, of our um, journey with this cancer. Lots of people, Carrie, Gary, the church, were going to Sharon in hospital praying for her. There were times where I could see the healing. I could see Sharon coming around. I was like, this is going to be one of the most amazing miracles. God, you are taking it to the 11th hour, but it's going to work. Our faith never dwindled. And then in May, she passed away. Is she healed? 100%. Will I understand her journey? No. None of us will. Some days we get reasoning and we think, no, we've done it. Other days we don't. I'm going to go into happier stories. And I see Anne's at the back there. Anne's, I was going to mention your mom. Is she gone? But did we pray for Irene Todd? We did. Did we think she was going to beat COVID? We did. She didn't, but you must hear her testimony in life. We were at her funeral, her, her memorial. What an amazing lady. So has she left a legacy? 100%. We're not going to live forever, guys. We're not. So three more stories. The one is more quick. Uh, my brother's sister-in-law, she's a medical doctor. At that stage, she used to live near us um, in Farmall. And one Sunday morning, everything happens on Sunday mornings. We were... We, I would come back from a cycle and I see my whole family is gathered in. We live on a plot and most of the family lives on this plot. And my whole family is gathered in the driveway. And my mom says, please, please, can you come pray? Nikki's just been in a hectic car accident. Now, if today still, if you drive up Molly Bongwe towards the Cruise Loop Highway, you'll see that those big, huge concrete uh, bus stops, um, Nikki decided to change the shape of them. So they're not in order because of her car. She was a typical A-type personality, leaving work at the last moment. She had to be in the hospital, probably not concentrating, and she drove full tilt into those barriers, into those uh, bus things. They spent hours trying to get her out of them. We prayed. The helicopter picked her up. We came and I prayed in the church. I remember that day. You know, Joshua said, Joshua there said to me, don't worry, Dad. God has already healed her in the helicopter. She should not be walking today. I'm not too sure about being alive, but she should not be walking, to, walking today. Three months later, we celebrated Christmas. She was starting to walk again. The doctors don't understand how she survived that crash. I have to say, I do understand. The next story, some of you guys have met Luke. Luke, this is for you. Now I'm going to cry again. And I've already asked Stu's dad if he allows me to not stick to 100% the truth. And what I mean by that is, the story's too long for me to keep all the truth in. Luke uh, was 10 years old. He's got a, a brain tumor. They live in Harare. His folks bring him down to, to South Africa to have the surgery. He has the tumor removed, but there's a huge hemorrhage. He bleeds out. Brain damage like you cannot believe. I started treating Luke. He was in vegetative state. I could see he was responding to our instructions, but nothing much more than that. We had to have two or three people help him when we tried to walk. He couldn't talk. Um, he was having all the therapies. At that stage, his dad didn't believe in God or Jesus. 
I'm not suggesting we do this, but his dad decides to strike a deal with God. And he prays to God. He said, God, if you save my son, I will do X, Y, and Z. And one of them is, he said he was going to fund a church in Harare. I'd worked with Luke on Friday morning. Saturday morning, there's a rugby match. They're also a very, very sporting family. Saturday morning, there's a rugby match. My phone rings. I'm not going to say his name, but it's Luke's dad phones. Why are you phoning me on a Saturday? It's during rugby. Okay, I'll answer the phone. I'll answer the phone. I'm going to mention his name. Stu says to me, <laughs> says, Stu, Stu, what's up? He says, just, I've got someone who wants to talk to you desperately. I treated Luke yesterday. So I take the phone, and uh, this guy says, hey, Just, how are you doing? I remember my head doesn't think Luke should be talking. So I'm like, I'm fine, thanks, and you? He says, I just want to say thanks for everything you've done for me. So I'm like, who's this? He says, it's Luke. It's me, Luke. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Luke? He says, no, I'm healed. God healed me last night. I kid you not. He could not walk on Friday. He was walking and talking on Saturday morning. Does God still do miracles? Luke is a miracle. Now, is Luke fully healed? No. Luke comes here. We've, we've prayed for him. His eyesight's still messed. Is Luke socially inappropriate? Still, definitely today. <laughs> will Luke get better? He will get better. I wish that we had the faith of Luke. Because Luke, yeah, it's tough work when you go out with him. You know, so last year, he stayed, spent some time with us. And we took him to, we, we worked hard. We were, it was Glenn and myself, we were cutting trees down. And then we were on our way back from Michalisburg and we stopped at a garage because Luke says he's starving. So I'm treating this 21-year-old like a child. I say, okay, Luke, but you can just get one thing. He says, no, that's all I want. I just want a pie. I'm starved. So we pull in. I buy him a pie. My kids say, no, they want ice creams. Luke says, my kids, oh, why have they got ice creams? I got a pie. So I said, because you asked for a pie. Oh, I want ice cream as well. So I go, huh. I give Luke an ice cream. He's got a pie full of tomato sauce and he's one mouth pie, one mouth ice cream. There's ice cream dripping down here, pie down there. A lady walks in. This is a true story. I'm not making any of this up. A lady walks in, no hair, obviously undergoing chemotherapy. Luke, picture, pie, ice cream. Hi, ma'am, how are you doing? I said, oh, Luke. I see you having cancer treatment. Yes, I am. Do you believe in Jesus? And she goes, I actually do. She says, me too. He healed me. Can I pray for you? Ice cream, pie. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> I want us to have that faith that Luke has. It's a child faith. But we're too caught up in what people then think about us. One more story. Quinn. Extra close to home. Quinton. Anyone who's been here longer than a year knows about Quinton. So for those who haven't been here longer than a year, Quinton is my cousin's son. They lived in Botswana. He came down uh, as a family. They came down to South Africa. Mom was on the phone to Dad, who was still in Botswana uh, farming. Granny was in the lounge. Granny thought Quinton was with Mom. Mom thought Quinton was with Granny. Quinton ventured off into the bathroom, and he liked to play in the bidet. He turned the bidet on, on hot water. Uh, Quinton was 18 months old. He just walked, just on to walk. Climbed into it and literally cooked himself. We don't know how long. I didn't know much about burn wounds back then. So when my family said, Justin, you need to show some urgency in your prayers, Quinton got burnt. So I was like, he'll be out of hospital next week. Don't worry. Long story short, it was almost a year in hospital. Almost a year. We prayed many times here. A couple of the times, Claudia would give me a shout while I was teaching the kids, and I would run in, and I'd say, guys, we need to pray again. We need to pray again. On, on Quinton's discharge from hospital, the nurses approached mom, Claudia, and said, do you know that 
Quinton should not be alive. There are five times that he should be dead. Of those five times, I am almost 100% sure we as a church were in prayer three of those times. We were praying our lungs out for Quentin, for his healing. Quentin is back home in Botswana. Quentin is laughing. He is behind where he should be as a two-year-old. He is behind in those landmarks. And he's not walking properly. I don't think he's even crawling yet. But is he healed? Yeah. He's healed. Do, do we want or expect more healing? Yeah. Yes. Are we ever going to give up on that? No. Those are my stories. This verse is from Paul. Well, it's from Corinthians, but it's Paul addressing the Corinthians. And I'm going to try and answer those questions now. That's where I'm going now. So does God answer our prayers or does God still heal today? Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Did Jesus heal everyone? In Luke 4, 38 to 44, it's about story about Jesus, and I think my pronunciation is okay, is, is in the village of Capernaum, or the city of Capernaum, however you want to say it. Capernaum. And he's just healing. People are coming from all the villages, and he's just healing. He's healing leprosy, blind people, deaf people, just healing. And literally, if you can imagine us gathering for All Blacks game, at Ellis Park, people are coming from everywhere, and he's just healing. The day comes to a close. He wakes up the next day. Jesus starts to head out of town. The guys stop him. They said, but there's still more people coming. Aren't you going to heal those people? And Jesus turns to them and said, I need to go and do the work that the Father has sent me to do, and that is to tell people about God. It's not because those people didn't have faith that he didn't heal them, but he came to do more than just heal. He had to go tell people about the coming I mean, not about coming, about God and the gospel. Is healing dependent on our faith? If a person's not healed, is it because we don't have enough faith? No, not at all. But one thing that is true in the Bible, I think, no, I know, on 100% of the incidences of healing, those people had faith. So Matthew 9, 20 to 22 is the story of, of the lady who was bleeding for, for 12 years. And she saw Jesus, and she pushes through the crowd just to touch him, because she says, if I only touch him, I will be healed. And she touches him, and Jesus turns around, and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. We need to have faith that we will be healed, but it's not because of our faith that we are healed or if we're not healed. James 5, 14 to 16, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. My next thing is, and it wasn't in those three questions, but does our sin... Do, we, do, do bad physical things happen to us because we've sinned? No. I can categorically state that's no. Is there consequence to our sins? Yes, there is. If you're a perpetual sinner, if you're a perpetual drunken driver, if you're a perpetual, a perpetual fast driver, if you sleep around, your marriage is going to break, you're probably going to have an accident. These things have consequence. Sin has consequence. Sin in our life, will affect our healing process. If we have sin, we live in a toxic environment. God has made us wonderfully in the same image as Him, right? Our cells thrive in a good, p 
peaceful environment. If you have sin, the environment for yourselves is not peaceful. If you, have, if you live a life of, being, of thinking you've been unforgiven, or if you are not forgiven, the body's system is not working in harmony. So does that affect your healing? Yes, it affects your healing. But it's not because you've sinned that God has punished you. Right. It's not that. Okay? The next story is, uh, I'm not too sure where in the Bible it is, but Jesus goes to the pool, the pool where the guys get healed, right? And he sees the leper, huh? Beth- Bethesda. And he goes down there, and, uh, and there's this leper. And he says to the leper, he says, do you want to be healed? The first thing the leper has is, is an excuse. No, no, it's too busy. I can't get down there. People push, up, push me out the way. Jesus has enough of it. He says, take your mat, roll it up, get out of here. <laughs> Jesus wants to affect your identity. If your identity is stuck in being ill, you're wasting his and your time. You need to want to change. You need to want to be healed. Your identity can't be in your ailments. Your identity needs to be in God who's fully restored you. You can't stay there. So, roll your mats up and go. Okay? Jesus has dealt with that. Don't let that be your identity. So, I'm going back to our story. The story of John. Let's go there. So, who was John? This John we talk about. I mean, apart from being a guy who lived on honey and locusts, who was he? He was... Close to Jesus, very close to Jesus. He actually even baptized Jesus. They rate him as one of the two greatest prophets after Elijah. He was tight with God. Imagine being John for a moment. We are tight with God. We do our quiet time. We speak with God. We're tight with Him. Jesus Sorry, John lands up in prison. We're tight with God. John is tight. He lands up in prison. What's the first question you think you ask God when something bad happens to you? Where were you? Am I believing in the right things? John has the same question. Are you the Messiah? Are you really the Messiah? I baptized you the other day. Now I'm in prison. What's happening? Aren't we tight? Aren't we meant to be everything go cool with me? When we accept Christ, is everything just meant to go cool? If we look back at all the disciples, not everything went cool. So Jesus answers him. And this is where I want you guys to take home. And tell John the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me. No matter what happens. We're tight with God. Bad things happen. Know that in those bad things, no matter what happens, our hope is in Christ. I'm going to steal a thing from Gary last week. God is more interested in happens, what happens inside you, not what happens to you or around you. John's heart stayed good. His hope in Christ stayed. He is healed today. He's at his place where he should be. Also from Gary last week. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I'll have hope in Him. You see, I want to bring another story as I close. And I, I, I don't know, Leash, how we're going to close this, but maybe the band should come up so long and maybe just play some music, because I think we're going to have moments of healing and prayer. But 
but back when we were at Broadacres, um, what was the place called? The Theatre, Cote Royale, hey? When we were in, yeah, Arena Royale, Arena Royale that's it. We had a, I had the privilege of working with a man named Peter Dupria, um, who, if you want to Google him, is the first man in the world as a quadriplegic to complete a full Ironman. But less of that, more of his testimony. He gave his testimony that morning, and my take home bit was, he said, because he's a quadriplegic, I just want to let you guys let that soak in for a moment. The only thing he can do is use his biceps, so he brings his arm up, his wrists don't work properly, and he's got limited um, upper body function, very limited, right? So he can move his head left to right, he can chew, he can talk, but fr from above my nipples down, he, nothing works, even in the arms, his biceps, his triceps don't work, and his chest doesn't work. And when faced with this dilemma, he was a sportsman, he was a South African school sportsman before. His life has been changed completely. He said, the only thing that has changed is the vessel that is carrying the word of God forward. No matter what ailment comes over us, just the vessel changes. You see, coming back to Quinton and Claude's, if you're listening, I'm not too sure if he's going to be healed the way we expect him to be healed. But will those scars bring people to ask him questions about his life? Yes. Is that an opportunity for him to give testimony of God? Yes, it is. We might never understand that. Is the peace that we feel now at the loss of our, my, our mother, my mother-in-law, men's mom, is the peace we feel now a reflection of where she is with God? Yes, it is. We don't stop crying and missing her. I promise you we don't. But there's a certain peace that we live with in knowing where she is. You always miss either a broken limb that you used to be able to run on or a family member that's passed on. You'll miss them. And you, we're allowed to miss them. We're allowed to mourn that. But our identity doesn't become that. Our identity is still the hope that God has given us. We'll all be restored when we're in heaven. But we've got an opportunity to live a restored life from now. You don't, you don't have to wait until I'm in heaven. I've got a guy, and I know he's listening to it, King Julian. He's a, he's a real righteous man of God. And he goes to the Rivers Church, and his, his wife is, is on the um, fellowship there, and they work hard. And he's, he's sustained multiple strokes. In actual fact, during COVID this year, so we treated him before he had the strokes. In COVID this year, he almost died twice, but should have been dead. But he's still alive. King Julian doesn't walk pretty. His life is a battle. That's a proper battle. Uh, he's, he's left side hemiplegic, so this arm is stuck up here. This leg doesn't want to touch the ground. And he sees us, and, uh, and he said something to me the other day. He said, I can't wait to have my new body when I'm in heaven. So I asked him a, a tough question. I said, so do you want to go? Are you ready to go? He says, no way. I'm not over this thing. I said, but King Julian, it's tough the way you are. He says, yeah, but I've still got time here. But I know my body will be restored in the future. And that's where we've got to be. We're going to be restored. 